And then it turns out that out of every billion dollars um, that nurses' pensions or firefighters' pensions or policemen or teachers' pensions go into entrepreneurs as an asset class, there tend to be, you know, everybody's got to make a living. Everybody needs a management fee to be able to, you know, be able to manage the money, be able to build the relationships that they need to build to invest into funds of funds. Those people need to find the best fund managers and build a portfolio of that. So they will find 15, 20 different venture funds that they'll invest in. And those venture funds all have to pay their bills. So they take a management fee. But out of every billion dollars out of nurses' pockets that are saved towards retirement, it's really only about 650 to 700 million dollars that actually makes it into entrepreneurs' hands. And then how does everybody make money? Well, entrepreneurs, you know, sell their stock and that stock's value grows and grows and grows. And out of every billion dollars in stock value that entrepreneurs create, you know, it's only about $700 million that ends up back into the nurses' pensions because, you know, everybody needs a bit of profit and a bit of upside, which is completely understandable. Um, but as a nurse, it still kind of upset me and kind of pissed me off. Um, and so I said, you know, how do we actually do this without charging management fees? How do we grow our community um, as big as we can, as hard and as far as we can, while choosing, um, well, choosing a limitation, which is let's not work based on a management fee. And the business model that we actually evolved is, I believe we built the world's first tech founder cooperative. Um, what it is, is we work with some of the best startups in our global community. Um, they pay in stock, common stock, which goes into a shared pool. Um, this pool is a very simple LLC. Um, some people call it a special purpose vehicle, some people call it a fund, but they pay common stock into this pool where other entrepreneurs pay common stock into. Um, and then about 200,000 out of the total million units that are available in this LLC for sale, 200,000 go back to the entrepreneurs. 300,000 hackers and founders keeps for long-term benefit. And then 500,000 um, we actually sell off to angel investors to really pay for the staff um, to help the startups out, to provide services, to be able to support them. Um, and it turns out the model actually works quite well. Um, um, and we've worked with now 55 companies in our founders cooperative. They have a combined market capitalization over the last four years. Um, it's probably pushing, if not a bit over $500 million in market cap at this point in time. Um, the companies have raised about $60 million as a group. We've had five exits now um, in liquidity events. So we are returning capital to our initial investors in our very first stock pool. Um, and I think we've found a model that is not only profitable for our investors, I think we can add a ton of value to our technology companies. We now have a staff of 12 people. Um, and we currently have a portfolio of about 25 um, tech companies in Mexico and in Silicon Valley that we're working with. And we can just add a ton of value, add a ton of help. Um, and what kinds of help and values we add, it's things like we, you know, our CFO works with them. We help them through the M&A process in our liquidity team. Um, we help them connect with designers very quickly and efficiently. We help them hire and recruit the right people. But 70% of our portfolio comes from abroad and lands in Silicon Valley. Um, and I spend a significant amount of time um, working with government officials, um, talking about the needs of small businesses and growing startup ecosystems globally. And through that, we've done a lot of work on immigration. Um, we're a few months away from being able to almost guarantee our portfolio companies visas um, through a program um, called an Entrepreneur in Residence program. It's a nonprofit fellowship um, which would give an entrepreneur the ability to be an entrepreneur in residence and have a fellowship and a stipend to work at a university um, in exchange for part-time work at the university and um, research and work on their company. Um, 
they've issued the first 22 visas through that global EIR program in Massachusetts as well as um, Colorado. We're very excited about the program starting to expand to Alaska, Florida, New York, and also Silicon Valley, obviously. Um, so we're working on that. We work with immigration, housing, what have you. It's very much kind of a white glove concierge kind of approach that we really take to these CEOs and CTOs who are coming here from abroad. And things that we've discovered are that there's a huge hole in the market um, that nobody else is really providing services around, which is helping companies from around the world come to Silicon Valley. This is what we started to see um, in 2008 and 2009, which is when the global economy tends to start slowing down, um, engineers slow down in their work, they become underemployed, and board engineers tend to start building things. Um, building little widgets, experimenting around with new technologies. Sometimes those experiments turn into actual products where people actually want what they're building. Um, then when they have a product and they start growing it into a company, um, generally these people want to come to um, the technotopia of Silicon Valley, which is really kind of a mecca for tech entrepreneurs. Um, they want to come to Silicon Valley, they want to meet people, they want to talk to people, they want to raise capital, they generally want to have a presence in Silicon Valley. And I started seeing this, we started seeing hundreds of entrepreneurs from around the globe show up at our events in 2009, 2010. And the questions they had were, how do I move here? How do I get money? Where can I go? How can I get there? Um, and what are the best ways for us to do this? Um, and through our global community of event organizers, we tend to get a lot of referrals inbound from these um, entrepreneurs from around the globe. We tend to host at least two groups of entrepreneurs or businesses or investors in our offices in Silicon Valley. People coming through learning about Silicon Valley, they might be interested in investing in Silicon Valley, they'd be interested in relocating their company here. Um, and there's a large number of technology companies that are growing around the world that have products that are selling things and they really just need a helping hand to be able to really expand their business and grow. Um, the last few months have been especially exciting for us. Um, we're starting to work with more senior companies. One of our companies, um, the CEO, can I talk about the name? Can I name the name? Um, it's called MX Pro. Um, one of the CEOs, he had 40 employees in Mexico. He was selling an ERP, which is software that, you know, uh, manufacturing companies use to run their company on. He had 40 employees. He was generating a million or two in profit every year. And um, he was living a good life. He was fishing. He was playing golf. He got his pilot's license. And after three years of that, he started to get bored. And he's like, well, you know what, I'm either going to buy an airplane or I'm going to move to Silicon Valley and grow my company. And Fernando decided to move to Silicon Valley and grow his company. So money from his airplane went back into the business and we're helping him open his Silicon Valley office. Um, he builds a remote team. Um, we help him here on business process, sales, growth. Um, at the time, he was doing that much revenue and profit just selling in Yucatan. Um, Mexico hadn't even approached some of the larger urban areas like Mexico City, which is one of the largest cities in the world. Um, hadn't really approached some of the large manufacturing areas in the north of Mexico. But he wanted to establish a base here and learn from here. He actively wanted to be challenged um, to grow his company and to be stretched. Um, and we've been working with him very hard over the last three months. He's changed his um, revenue model. He's changed his sales process. Um, his financial controls in the company have actually gotten a lot tighter. Um, his, technology, um, his technology production and creation and building, um, porting his new platform from a desktop application to a web application is really starting to accelerate. 
And frankly, it's just delightful um, to watch these CEOs and company founders be able to kind of come here and finally stretch their wings, um, work in the same office with other CEOs and CTOs, and grow their companies. And that's a story that we're starting to see happen over and over again. Um, so what's next for Hackers and Founders and Silicon Valley? We've opened our Mexico program. Um, it's been going very, very well. We have our first five companies in our Mexico program. Um, two of them, I believe, are selling. One of them is profitable. Um, one of them is actually up here and giving a talk at an artificial intelligence conference that we're going to hold this Friday up in, my, in, up in San Francisco. Um, we have, um, we're going to be down in Mexico next week. Um, Hackers and Founders Mexico is helping organize one of the, if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be the world's largest hackathon. We have about 25,000 people, um, highly educated, tech savvy, engineering friendly people at an event called Campus Party. And we're going to run in parallel this hackathon with 25,000 attendees. Um, people don't necessarily think of Latin America as an engineering hub. And having grown up down there and speaking Spanish fluently, um, I've been amazingly surprised and overwhelmed with the quality and the hunger of, um, te for tech entrepreneurship. Um, we're, and I'm seeing that no matter where I go in the world, I've been asked to speak in China. Um, Chairman Xi is now saying that their five-year plan um, revolves around innovation and revolves around entrepreneurship. Um, the previous five-year plan had been very, very focused and um, party officials from states and cities were essentially graded, and per graded on their performance on growing GDP. So everybody was pushing very, very hard on growing GDP, and you saw some of those numbers um, over the last decade or so as China's been growing. Now those same people are being evaluated on squishier things like their innovation and the number of entrepreneurs that are happening, um, the number of entrepreneurships, uh, companies that are being founded and scaling. And we're seeing a lot of really interesting technology being created in places like Shenzhen, um, a lot of pretty huge software companies um, in China. And we've also seen a number of investors just kind of stop by our offices cold um, or call us or connect through us on LinkedIn saying, hey, we're very interested in investing in technology companies in Silicon Valley. Do you have any of those? Yes, yes we do. Um, and we're really seeing this global movement um, the world economy has been slowing down a little bit. Europe has been really quite interesting. Um, those of you who, you know, uh, are familiar with economics, they know that, you know, the European banks have essentially been doing quantitative easing or printing capital to try to inject it into the economy in Europe to try to help it grow. Um, that capital is injected all over Europe, but yeah, some pieces are, you know, they love all their countries equally, some of them just a little bit more equally than others. And so in Germany, for instance, the economy is booming right now. There's a large amount of capital flowing in Berlin as a startup hub, and we're actually starting to see things in Berlin like, you know, almost kind of hyperinflation-y things like real estate prices in Berlin are growing through the roof. You've also seen that in areas like San Francisco. Um, you've seen things like venture funds. Year to year, they tend to raise 20 to $25 billion a year. Um, last, year in Silicon, uh, last year, the venture capital in the United States raised $50 billion. Um, in Berlin, you have a number of large venture funds um, being created, starting to invest in technology companies, and a lot of really interesting and compelling engineering is happening there. And we think that hackers and founders, we can have a pretty unique opportunity to help take these companies from some of these regional hubs, help them connect to Silicon Valley, and really help them globalize. How we're thinking of the future in the next few years in our product that we offer to startups is really globalization as a service. Um, 
I think the new normal is two to 20 person companies using technologies that give them an exponential leverage um, in the business market. What do I mean by that? I mean, small little teams like 12 people who built the photo sharing app called Instagram are able to reach a market of about 50 million people within fairly short order. And that company and their gross trajectory gets sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. It's another company that focuses on helping people talk through their mobile phones using data plans instead of using text minutes. WhatsApp had um, 30 people on staff, and if I'm not mistaken, they had a 20-person engineering team, and they were reaching 300 million people. Um, from what I've heard, their engineering team is now up to 50 people, and they have over a billion people on their platform. In what other era of the world, in what other part of the economy do you see a 50-person team touching base with a billion customers? Um, that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing is that you have very small companies being able to use software to reach exponential growth. Um, one of our companies, Inzopa.com, um, they wandered around for a couple of years trying a bunch of different products. And in the last 12 months, they've really hit their stride. Um, they get banks to give them um, data and give them exclusive license to real estate transaction data, loans, mortgages, financings, that sort of stuff. They take that data, use their artificial intelligence engine to generate marketing material automatically. That's really hyper-targeted to people who are buying a home in Santa Clara and they're looking for a seven-year adjustable rate mortgage. Um, if you do that type of web search, you're probably going to hit Inzopa's results very quickly. They're also creating results for mobile, for email campaigns, um, for advertising campaigns. Um, and they're being able to take this technology. In the last 12 months, they helped their customers do $150 million in new business. Um, it was at that point a three-person team. And they have since been able to raise a bit of capital. Um, they, um, I believe, have raised about $500,000. They're going out and they're raising actively right now, but they've just doubled their team. And in the last four to five months, if I'm not mistaken, they've actually closed another $2.5 million worth of revenue that they've contracted, that they booked that revenue for in Zopa. So, um, again, small team high-powered technology, exponential leverage. So what does that look like when you're talking about places like Mexico, Uruguay, Chile, Shenzhen? You now have a very small team that can use a technology to actually reach the entire world. Um, and how do you find a two to 10 person company that's doing something really huge when you don't really have much tech press around? When you don't have, you know, the New York Times reporter, um, you know, sipping a latte at the cafe, you know, creamery up in San Francisco on 4th Street. Um, it tends to be through the personal networks that people develop at these events. And we're starting to see these companies come through our networks. Um, and we're really excited about being able to get these companies the chance to really spread their wings get capital as needed and really grow through the rest of the world. Um, other things that we're actually particularly excited about, there's been a lot of buzz around artificial intelligence recently, big data. Um, the hipster nerds among us um, are saying things like, those are technologies that I have been like so using for the last 15 years. Oh my God, I've so done that, been there. Um, but now it seems like the cost of computing power um, is really hitting a low point in that it's really cheap to have a lot of computing power on demand. And you can actually do things using these artificial intelligence techniques um, that five years ago would have taken you 48 hours to produce one computation or one result. Now you can do that within 4.8 minutes. Um, 
and you have several orders of magnitude, much more power. And so interesting things around AI are developing. You'll see the same stuff around augmented reality, virtual reality. This is technologies that you've been seeing in movies for years, except now the movie screens are going to be essentially on your face um, and in HoloLens, like on your glasses that you're actually looking through. Um, we're also very excited about the cost there's a company called Raspberry Pi. It's a nonprofit, actually. They're based in the United Kingdom. And their goal is to see how inexpensively they can actually build a general pur purpose computer for. So a couple years ago, they were able to build a circuit board with chips on it um, that could really function completely as an operating system if you plugged it up to a television monitor or a computer monitor and a keyboard you had a fully functioning computer and their cost was $25. Um, the current product line that they're actually starting to ship is called the Raspberry Zero and their price point is now $5. Now, think, I can get a full computer for $5. My family's first computer cost dad about $2,400 because dad wanted to manage the family's database um, and the mailing list on it. And um, <clears throat> we purchased the computer for $2,400. And it was probably, it was a little bit over a month's salary. Um, now, in countries where people make $2 a day, you know, extreme poverty is defined as $2 a day, these people can actually conceivably afford one of these little small computers. And so the chance for intelligent, young people who have access to these technology tools to build solutions to problems that nobody else is seeing is really pretty amazing. This last week, I ran into a doctor from Chile, and um, he had been a burn surgeon, um, decided to open up a clinic for, free clinic for diabetics to heal foot wounds. Um, he then, um, worked for an insurance company for a number of years. He really kind of was horrified at the health industry and how much of it seemed to be money-driven instead of care-driven. Um, so he decided that he was gonna try to bring some of these very expensive tools and try to sell them to small primary care clinics and physicians who had their own small practices for a dollar a patient a year. So when I worked as an emergency room nurse, we had a system called PAX where we could take an x-ray and we could ask a radiologist who was living 20 miles away, we could scan the x-ray, send it over via PAX, the radiologist could actually load it up on his computer, take a look at the x-ray, and then call the report back to the emergency room physician so they could do that. These systems cost multiple millions of dollars. <clears throat> And it, wor and it works because radiologists in the United States tend to do about three hundred dollars to $500,000 a year in salary. Um, so it makes sense to make the time as efficient as possible and to spend millions of dollars doing that. However, when you're in a country where you're 100 or 200 miles away from the next radiologist, what do you do when grandpa might have a pneumonia? You can't do that chest x-ray. Or even if you can buy an x-ray machine, how do you actually have someone double check your x-ray reading? So their first product was a PAC system that they're um, using in primary care clinics and they're selling it to these clinics for $1 per patient per year. They have 3.5 million patients' data on their system being transported. They're making revenue. The company did $350,000 in revenue last year. They have a 25-person engineering team because um, you have economies of cost. Um, <clears throat> engineers make quite a bit less down there. But they're building a world-class software system dedicated towards improving the world's health at really pennies on the dollar for what can be done in the United States. They're actually having major multinationals like Siemens, who builds these PAC systems, come to them and say, we can't compete with you in your technology can we please resell it? And they'll like, yeah, you can sell our technology for us on one condition. What's that? You can't charge more than $1 per patient per year. 
they're a little frustrated, but nevertheless, they do want to offer the state of the art to their customers. And so that's what they're doing. That company we're now in discussions with, how do they actually expand to the rest of Latin America and to the rest of the world? Um, I'm not a fan of techtopias. I don't think that the world is going to be perfect um, anytime soon, but I do think that impassioned people um, building companies with goodwill and a mission to change things for the better um, are really going to be one of the most important things in the next decade or two. And these are the types of people that we actually work with. Um, <clears throat> We're very excited about that. Um, it's entrepreneurs like this that we actually want to give the opportunities to. And one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about entrepreneur capital, in Latin America, they don't necessarily call it venture capital, they call it entrepreneur capital, which is how do companies, how do entrepreneurs get the capital that they need to grow their businesses? What I love about the asset class of angel investing is it's one of the very, very few asset classes where that capital goes directly into providing jobs and growing the economy. Um, <clears throat> I talked with the head of a development bank this morning, and she said that their metrics are for every dollar that they actually invest, they get a return, a social return worth $6.4 in terms of jobs and jobs created and economy created. Um, and not only that, but they've actually seen some significant returns through their venture portfolio that they actually invest in. And this is why I'm so passionate about teaching people how to invest in entrepreneurs, how to build portfolios of these products, um, because I really do think that if we can actually grow this economy or grow this practice, we can grow this economy. Um, I'm on an SEC committee for um, capital formation for small and medium businesses. It's 14 people. Um, it's the only part of the SEC that's dedicated to figuring out how small businesses get money. And one of the reports that we were presented was, is that there was last year, there was $160 billion that were invested privately into computers. And the consensus of the people in the room was that this was great, that the markets were very healthy. Silicon Valley is probably a little frothy and overheated. And I raised my hand and I said, you know, that's great, but these are the companies that produce two thirds of our jobs, three quarters of our economic growth. And I think the world needs more jobs and more economic growth. I said, do you know how much um, the lottery is? How big is the lottery industry in the United States? And everybody kind of stared at me blankly. I said, it's $60, mil $60 billion a year. So we're expect essentially expecting 2.5 lotteries to provide all of this country's economic growth and the majority of its new jobs. I don't think that's enough. I think that we need to scale this and this is why we're actually gonna start um, doing more of these webcasts. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our CFO, Mr. Jonathan Angel. 